everybody. I'm here to introduce our two speakers. So up first, we have Monica Landers, who is a co-founder and CEO of StoryFit, a rapid growth technology company which provides AI analytics for the publishing and entertainment industry. With two media technology patents, Monica's deep experience in media extends from producing for ABC News and Good Morning America to executive leadership at multiple content companies, including VP Media Innovation at Demand Media. Monica has deep roots in Austin's startup communities and is an advisor to accelerators, universities, and organizations such as South by Southwest and Women at Austin. And after her, we will have Mary Brenza, who is the VP Strategy at StoryFit. She leads marketing, business development, and strategy. She has held key digital leadership positions within media organizations like Hearst and Verizon. She founded AppExpress, a self-serve mobile app builder designed to help businesses reach their customers in an easy and affordable way and launched a national local search website, Go Local. Hey, so I'm Monica. It's great to be here. I have sure enjoyed um, this conference so far. It's my first time to Canada and my first time to Toronto and my first time at BookNet. Um, but it's been great just to see the, um, the conversations and the organization of this presentation. So I feel like there's a high bar. Um, our goal today, I, I mean, it's a little provocative to combine both creative and AI. So the goal today is just kind of start the conversation. A lot of what I'm saying sounds really new right now. There's not a lot of companies trying it, and I'll tell you why. But guaranteed this is coming, you know, five years, ten years, this is going to be so common. This isn't even going to be a stressful conversation. And I think a lot of good can come out of it, although I know now it's a little bit of like, what, what are we doing? Um, all right, so let's get started. So we're based in Austin. Uh, we, um, you know, all as individuals and as a company, think we have the most fun of all because we're really at the cutting edge of the technology and also in the middle of, I mean, what could be better than finding a way to tell a good story? And so this is really our focus is what can we do with the, the latest technology, but also apply it to something that matters. It doesn't just matter because we're a publishing industry. It matters because I think this is the core of who we are as humans. This is how we learn, how we share, how we connect. So, so we take it very seriously that we're intersecting these two, these two worlds. Um, our CTO is an undergrad, you know, Stanford Lit major, and then went on to, to Berkeley, right, with data science and, and worked for Apple. So we truly, not just as a company, but as our core DNA, really care about the, the, the entire process. So today, we are going to um, go over just a little bit about how it works, just so you have an understanding, because AI is a super broad term that almost becomes irrelevant when you start talking about specific projects. And then we're going to zoom in on one book and say, OK, so what can AI really do? Like, what does it understand from this one book? Which is different than what you or I necessarily take away if we read a book. And then we're going to take it back out and say, you know, well, here's what AI can do now across a corpus of books, or here's actual tangible, tangible applications, both now and then going forward in the future that you can watch for. So I hope you'll walk away today with just a, a comfort level in asking questions and an understanding as more and more of this technology starts popping up in different ways, that you'll have the framework to recognize it and feel comfortable um, both trying it out, you know, asking the questions, um, and, and, and thinking about how it might apply and make your life easier. OK, so the, so the why there's so few companies doing this kind of application on content right now is because you know, AI is hard, um, but you see it in, in areas like social listening. You know, your, your Facebook feed is organized thanks to AI. Um, search engines interpreting kind of NLP, that's, that's also um, AI. And then the chat box. So all of these are AI applications on language, right? Now, the next step, though, is applying it not just to language, but to narrative text, right? Because a book isn't just a bunch of words that you've added together. And, and taken a snapshot of. What matters in a book is how the plot changes, how the characters change, what kind of, what evolves, what's meaningful. And so to measure that change is a whole nother level of NLP. And so that's why everyone's not doing it right now, is it's very specific. Um, it, you know, it's one that's gonna get easier, and so you're gonna see more of it. But also, it, part of building this, it just takes a lot of time because it's not been, it's not been done at this level before. Um, <clears throat> now, part of the reason also is that there's a lot of information in a book, right? So you're wanting to look at not just the, all the things that you have a sense of a feel when you read a book 
to use NLP means you have to translate into something measurable, right? So the pacing is not just one measurement, it's a hundred different measurements that come together to say, ah, oh, this is the pacing of a book. Um, the topics and the theme, the themes don't matter in isolation, they matter because no other book has covered this theme or because a book is looking at it differently, right? So all of this has to be taken into context. This is how we look at a movie script or a book. So each line is a separate, in this case, these are movies. Each line is a separate script. And so for us or for the machine to read it, it has to be pulled out into a machine interpretable language, which means that we're measuring more than 100,000 elements out of the book and then turning it into something that we can then measure, use to measure and compare. Each of these measurements alone are pretty meaningless. It's how they're combined and whether they appear together that's meaningful, and this is the kind of stuff that only a machine can really learn and, 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 and absorb. If I was to really just simplify what we do, um, we take a book, we measure key features, then we compare it to thousands of books, and then from that we get general um, insights. Now, a lot of when I say here's what we do, a lot of it is at the level of research and, and, and figuring things out. So this isn't, uh, I'm trying to balance it and make sure you know this isn't, you know, this isn't me selling a product. This is me framing what I guarantee you um, you're going to be um, learning about, you know, for the next years to come. Um, so one thing you can do if you're interpreting and reading lots of reading, machine reading lots of books, is that you can make comparisons um, across a huge number of books. So you know as a publisher, you're in there saying, well, what is, what is the trend? What is going on? So this is something that's easy to do when you're looking at a lot of data. And so for example, this is just, just kind of for fun, we took the 200, 200 best-selling books across the last 20 years and just said, all right, like, what's happening in general? What trends like, pop up? Um, so here's one with a um, dual point of view. So uh, Gone Girl is an example. What's interesting is it came out in 2012, and so you, the peak of this happened just after Gone Girl. And you remember what that was like, like everyone was looking for the next Gone Girl. So then, then that trend kind of declined. Um, another trend that you see, kind of a lift and a decline, was dystopian. I'm assuming all of this is sort of resonating with your experience. Um, but what is interesting sometimes is really check kind of what, it, what you feel with, with what's measurably. Um, the other thing we're seeing is a slight decline in the tone, not the genre of comedy, but the tone of, of, of books being funny in the bestsellers. Uh, and likewise, mental health as a theme, so a thematic part of a book, um, is on the rise. Another thing we checked, it's interesting because we did, I was just at South By and we talked to the, to the film part of South By last week and so we did a lot of this on the movie side. And one of the things I'd asked them to check into was guns. And they did it on both books. And I just thought it was interesting that guns, for example, is just level. Like guns as part of a key theme hasn't gone up or down the last 20 years. However, crime has changed. So I, I think those are the kind of things that when you can just ask a million questions and you don't have to go and, and do the research and pour through it um, is, is really interesting. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is just take it all the way in and say, all right, if, if, if this type of technology looks at, a, at one book, what's some of the information that comes out of it? So when we're doing this, we say, look, this information can be applied to a lot of different types of decisions. Um, information about your content can be applied at acquisitions time. In other words, a way of pre-sorting through slush piles, finding out where you want to start with. Maybe you're looking for a particular theme. Maybe you're looking for something that resonates with a certain audience. But it's a way of, of, of not missing something you really want because it's sitting in an unreadable, in an unreadable place. Um, when we first started doing this with publishers, I wouldn't get feedback. We'd do, yeah, yeah, we'll run, you know, let us run 50, we'll run 100 for you. I wouldn't get feedback for six months as to whether it was accurate because that's how, long, that's how far behind um, the slush pile reading was. And so this is just, that's just you know, one application of it. Another place is creative development. We do this more on the film and movie side um, than we do because there's, there's, it's, a, it's, a lo it's a longer period and there's a lot more decisions that are in the millions of dollars range that they're, that they're making during that time period, but that can be used here as well. Um, the book to movie, what's interesting is we have studios that are as interested in the book analytics as publishers, and that's because they know you're sitting on a gold mine, right? 20% of the movies come from books, and they perform 50% better. 
So, you know, this is something that they're watching and they're trying to figure out how do we move faster on, how do we figure out what the books to look at. So some of this information helps give, a, give an early flag. Um, and, then, and then lastly, marketing. So we've gone the whole gamut from, from acquisitions all the way to marketing because if you know all this information about a book, you can then say, okay, well, here's, your, you know, here's, here's information that can help you reach the audience. So this is sort of the, the big picture application. Now, one thing that we talk about a lot is what is it like to actually work with the technology? Um, and it's a little bit like inviting this guy to your creative conversation, right? So Sheldon from the Big Bang, and if you haven't seen the TV show, you still know the stereotype that he plays, right? So he's a science guy, and he's gonna deliver the information exactly how he sees it, exactly just the facts. It really doesn't matter if it's gonna hurt your feelings or not. Like, this is, this is the facts, this is how you see them. And so he's not front of mind uh, to have involved in a creative conversation, right? But there are some things that he does really well. So real time, you know, he's, he's read hundreds of thousands of books and he remembers all the characters, all the settings, all this information. By the way, um, you know, our Sheldon has also watched hundreds of, uh, tens of thousands of movies as well, right? So he has all of this information that he's coming to when he offers comparisons. So this is the kind of thing that, that, that Sheldon, as he represents technology, can do really well. He's objective in the sense that he delivers the information every time. Doesn't matter if he had coffee or not that morning. Doesn't matter whether he has time to read, right? It's, you're, you're getting consistent information and you're getting it at scale. So these are the things that AI is good, good at, but it still has a different presentation than if you have a book you're reading and you ask for your you know, colleague's opinion on it. It's gonna come in a different format when you get it with technology. And it looks uh, a little bit like this. So this is an interesting book. Has anyone read Stags? It's a YA. <clears throat> Good, so as I tell you about it, you'll have to see if, if you're beginning to understand and picture the book. Because again, it is a different brain process, but I think by the end, you'll have a sense of what this book is like. Um, it was recently optioned um, for a movie as well. Okay, so the machine takes you know, a couple minutes and comes back and says, here's, here's what this book is like, and here's some of the information that, that is um, able to pull. Is First of all, the setting. And not just like it's in you know England, but like real specifically, what are the counties? What are the where are the places that this takes place? So we know it's in England. The settings then are identifying the settings you know within the location. It's a high level of um, of woods and forest, right? You've got a Gothic medieval setting. So so far it could we really don't know if it's past or present, right? Because of just the descriptions. Um, it's in the fall. You've got high school's information. You've got boarding school. Again, some signals that it might be in the past, Victorian attire, dresses and gowns. But then we've got all these media references. And this is one of the things we measure um, because it really does help to identify who the audience is of a book, how it's gonna, re how it's gonna relate, and how you might market it. And, and the media references now come with an extraordinarily high number um, of, of movie references, but it ranges kind of from the 80s um, up. And so again, if you're trying to place the time, well, well we know it's somewhere, you know, it's at, least, it's at least later than whatever the latest movie we've got. Um, however, we also measure all the technology references, again, because this helps you to place who's your audience, where can you advertise, you know, where can you advertise or promote the book. Um, and this has a lot of current technology references. So now, which is also consistent with contemporary YA. So now you kind of have a framework of, of where this book is going. We also look at topics. And, and again, I sort of mentioned this earlier. It doesn't just matter that it's a topic, but it matters that it's a topic that's meaningful um, it's meaningful in books. So there are certain topics, maybe it's either topics that have been pre-designed as this is something that, that you care about, but also that it's a unique and standout. Um, you know, I'm trying to, sideways glances could come up in a lot of books, but it doesn't matter that you need to know that that's a key topic, right? It's like, what, what are the meaningful? And that's part of the work that, that is important when you're outputting this. So, 
So now we know one of the key um, topics is Hollywood movies and, and actors, which is interesting. And of course, we already have a sign of that because of how much movies is discussed. Uh, the other thing we see is some interesting like um, Pax and Tribe mentality, war and military strategy, um, but also falling in love. So you've already got kind of this broad. Um, what we know now from looking at the book is there's actually our two tribes, tribes, the medievals and the savages. And this is part of, part of the story that's going on. Um, there's also this uh, look at um, as far as actions and activities, and this is something you also want to see in books, is that you've got this hunting and fishing, and you've got high-class fancy balls. So when you look at what are the biggest events, this, uh, the chases and the emergencies and action, but also you see some, you know, a little bit of, uh, a, a little bit of, uh, uh, of the parties and the other stuff that's going on too. Now, the book advertised that there are nine students, but when we do a snapshot of the character network and how they relate, we see there's three core students, right? So, so let's just review what we know now, is you've got three students in an English boarding school with some, both excitement and some romance. So you can already see that this is falling into um, a, a story that, that is, is somewhat familiar and, and comfortable in the YA uh, genre. When we measure this, what, what the thick lines is how many conversations and how much, how much time they spend together in the book. And so the, the, you know, so Greer um, speaks to Henry and Shafeen, you know, the most. Shafeen and Henry have their primary relationship with her and then again with each other. And so each of the line, the thickness is, is how much conversation there is. So the other thing that matters when you're considering a book is the protagonist and how they fit. I think the top three traits of Greer are interesting because they also happen to be what movie studios are always asking for, frankly, is they want a sympathetic, likable main character, and especially appealing that she's smart, and what can be more fun than authority challenging, right? So just right off the bat, you have a character that, if you're looking for um, book to movie, is going to be interesting. So because it's so small, it just reads to some of the other personality traits that are measured that could come up. If she could be, um, it could be modesty, um, outgoing, adventurous, cheerfulness, um, orderliness, like that came up really low. So it's, it is interesting to see what she scored high on, but it's interesting to see what she didn't rank on as well, like low self-discipline, right? So um, yeah. It, it's a, no one another measurements. I think I pulled some, there's a lot of slides and I pulled some of them out because I remember that hedonism was a pretty high measure too. So, you, but you start to get a sense of who she is and, and where she's going to fit. Um, it also, we know what she needs, so what she's yearning for. So there's, there's opportunities in the storyline, but what she's looking for is closeness and stability and structure, which you can pretty much guarantee that's not the situation she's just been dumped into. And again, by looking at where she doesn't score, you can imagine a completely different book. It would be different if I was telling you that her needs were um, love and harmony, right? That's a different character. And so that's what I like about this, is it is really a snapshot of, of, of where you're going with the book. Um, one of the things that's important, too, is not just there's not a right or wrong to where these levels are, but it's important that the protagonist goes on an emotional journey, right? That there's change across the way. So that's one of the things that's just kind of a, a check, check box is, is there change? Or, or is she moving through the book? And so some of these measurements are simply looking at, is there movement and change? Um, what I wanted to show you is a couple of them, like disgust and fear and anger. Um, I had an intern just go straight to the book. So it's measured and it tells you what chapter it is and where it is in the book, is to go to that and just record what's happening there. So each um, message is what's happening at that high, first highest point of the book. Um, disgust, the, high, the peak is when Greer is reacting to eating raw deer liver it's with disgust, right? Um, the fear, this is chapter nine, so it's, the high, the, it's really the third high point, but that highest point. Um, she's really, um, I love, I love, she's creeped out. She's creeped out by the, the dead stag's head, and she doesn't like the food with blood in it. So that's, she's really uncomfortable in that place. And then in anger, basically, uh, uh, her friend, if you remember the, one of the, the three, is um, shot. And the quote from that is, is, what the hell happened? So that's where she really pops up with anger. So I, I'm more just trying to tie it to the book. Like, it's not just made up. You can go back and say, oh, yeah, I see why. I see where this came from. And again, what we like to see here is some peaks, you know, 
if, if, if there's no anger, if there's no, none of these strong emotions, and, and believe me, there's sometimes when all you register is happiness and sadness, um, it doesn't have the same you know, umph that, that you're, you're probably looking for in a, in a wife. This is again back to the changing. These are other, the other measurements is you really want to see more of a change. Like she, she grows in her conscientiousness, her expressiveness, she, she goes kind of, you know, closes it in the middle and is coming back out at the end. Her extroversion, she looks like she must have come in hard at the beginning and then just really um, kind of shut down and gotten through. But again, this is the measurements not because there's a right or wrong, but because you just, you just want to see movement. One of the things we do when I mentioned sorting through, um, th sorting through the um, slush pile, something we did, I mean, early on, just to see can, can we help with this. Um, and I, I, I had a quick conversation um, this morning too with, with Wattpad, who I guess you're familiar with. And they, they have a similar approach of like, there's gotta be a way to just uncover, you know, what book we should look at or what book might appeal to our particular audience. And so this is the area where they're, and I'm happy I'll kind of, we have time at the end for conversation, but this is the area that sometimes hits people wrong, is that it's a way of, of basically saying the elements in this book are going to appeal to this audience. In this case, it, the elements in this book, a bestseller score is just a mass audience appeal, right? There's elements in this that a mass audience is gonna be comfortable with. Um, the industri industry appeal is based on several of the publishers that we were delivering to that we know that this is the type of book that they want. And so it's a way really of helping them kind of identify and gut check and also just make sure they don't miss something along the way. And we identify the, um, the genre too and it's something that we can measure. So we have models for each genre and then say this is your, you know, this is where it fits. So one of the things when you're now looking at a book um, is you think, where does it fit into the current um, trends? And so, again, this is one of those conversations that I hear people having, like, I wonder if. And so one of the benefits of AI is they can quickly look and say, oh, well, how does this, this co like, contemporary as a microgenre of YA or of anything else, how is, that, how is that working? And so it's like, all right, well, contemporary is a genre that's increasing. So, all right, we, you know, we have a market there. Coming of age stories. Um, you know, been pretty level, right? So this is, again, this is just like, to me, the, the, the gut check of, yeah, okay, this is where we're going. Um, when we look at thematics of high school and friendship were two of the things we looked at because it relates to this, you see kind of stories about friendship on the rise, high school taking a dive. Does this mean you don't do the book? No, you know, but maybe you keep looking for other ways to feature it, or maybe you say, you figure, look, we're gonna break the trend and really feature that this is high school because there are not a lot of books out there on high school right now, right? So there's different ways to approach it. It's not meant to be right or wrong. It's meant to be Sheldon saying, hey, did you think of this? Hey, did you think of this? Hey, did you think of this? Um, one of the things we saw, which I thought was particularly interesting because this uh, trend in diversity is not present in movies. And because we look at this across movies and film as well, I I'm t that, that line was almost you know, straight across. And so, but whereas you see the, the diversity of characters in books is, is really shot up. So, uh, you know, you're not just talking about <laughs> putting in more diverse characters. It gets, it's really happening, right? Um, and ditto with LGBT. Um, a theme of feminism is also um, increasing. You see that really jump up right about 2013, 2013 to 14. And, and that was a part of a theme of this book as well. What I wanna do now is turn this over to Mary um, because I wanna give you some ideas of, uh, we've looked at all this about one book, but now how do you apply it? And one of the easiest applications currently, and I think that's a better fit for publishers, is solving the challenges of marketing. We know we love this book, right? You didn't, you didn't need all the information that I gave you to know that you're gonna like the book, right? You read it and you've got the book, but what are the, what, how can we find the right audience and how can we expand the audience? Or how can we mature an audience that we have for these other books by introducing them to this? So some of these types of questions, um, Again, you have Sheldon at the table saying, well, have you thought of this? We've noticed these themes. So this is a more of a direct application um, uh, that happens. And so what we wanna talk about now is just kind of, let, let's now pull it back down to real life. What are some of the applications? I know every time I walk out of having a conversation about what I just talked about, everyone's like, okay, that's interesting. 
you know, what do I do with it? And so we're just going to talk about some of the things that are, exist now, that are, coming, that are coming down the road um, across for publishing. And of course, we're seeing all of this in movies and film, too. So this, this is sort of a broad, um, a broad cross section. Um, Mary, as you know, has a great background in publishing and has been um, having to find uh, <laughs> publishing and marketing solutions for a long time. So she's a, she's a great resource for you. Thanks, everyone. I'm really excited to be here as well. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, so I spent a lot of time coming to Toronto for vacations. I, and I, um, I'm a huge fan of your library system, um, biggest right in North America. So lots of community of readers. Um, lots of really fun things to do in Toronto, so really excited to be back. Um, like Monica said, I'm going to talk through some, ma some marketing. And like she said, she really went kind of big picture AI. I'm going to talk about some tangible things that you can do. And I'm coming from a perspective of a marketer. I just spent, um, prior to StoryFit, I was working at Hearst, and I was do leading a digital marketing team. So I've done search engine optimization for Google for a long time, Facebook advertising, you name it. I've worked on it, and so I feel like I can come from that place, and hopefully that's helpful to you all. OK, so the first solution is probably the most popular one that you've all heard of. How many of you have heard of using automated keywords for Amazon? Yes, all the hands are going up. Right. OK, well, so obviously that big retailer that begins with an A um, is the only one that accepts keywords. And so what we, publishers come to me and say is, look, we're wearing so many hats, we don't have time to find keywords for our backlist. And so this is a solution that um, machine learning and AI can help solve. And so, for example, if you're the publisher of the Da Vinci Code and you are, um, your, your keywords would be Rob, Robert Langdon and religious mysteries, right? And so these, just to take a step back, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, these are powering Amazon's search engine. And the ultimate goal really is for people to find and discover your book, right? We're just driving them to your product page, and your product page has got to convert them. So that's one application. One of the most interesting things that I learned on a panel last week is that only 30% of all books published have keywords. And I was just blown away by that because actually StoryFit has done some studies and we see a direct link from adding keywords to actually lifting sales results. And actually there was another panel earlier today that talked about discoverability and the results um, for making your books more discoverable with machine automated keywords were as part of that panel as well. I think what's interesting here is that it's all sizes of publishers, all types of books, front list, back list, fiction, nonfiction, and you're seeing sales lift. Now obviously you can see back list had less of, um, and th these books didn't have sales for five months prior, so there's a really deep back list, but just if there's a takeaway, keywords help increase sales revenue. One of the other applications that I think is fascinating is BISAC codes. How many of you know that BISAC codes come out new every year? So do you know how many pages of BISAC codes came out in 2018? I just looked because I was curious. 25 pages of new codes. So there's a lot happening actually with BISAC codes because there's a lot going on in publishing, right? And so if you're not in the correct BISAC category, there's a problem, right? Because Retailers are having problems putting it on the shelf. Obviously, on online retailers are using this, and there's also a discoverability problem. This is another thing that we can use the same technology that Monica was talking about to provide accurate keywords. Um, one of the things that I often get that I love is the fact that it's actually the bisect and keyword combination that puts you in a lot of browse categories. How many of you all knew that? Nobody's raising their hands. Good, so I gave you another takeaway. So if you're wondering why you're not appearing and you have the Amy Schumer biography under comedians, biographies, and memoirs, it's because you don't have the correct BISAC um, comedy keyword combination. And what you can do is you can look up on Amazon for browse categories, and there's another like 18-page document that will list these out. Again, this is really hard to do if you're a marketer and I know how many hats you're wearing, so this is a great solution for automation. Um, another really cool solution that really shows the power of AI is scale. And like Monica said, it's not just looking at one book, but it's comparing books. <laughs> Thanks. It's comparing, it's comparing um, hundreds of thousands of books in real time. We actually offer this solution to our movie studio clients where we're comparing and contrasting over 100,000 different movies. Um, but what's interesting about it is it's not just providing a similarity score 
So as you can see, um, this is The Handmaid's Tale. Shout out to a Canadian author, right, Margaret Atwood. And another one for The Room as well, Irish American, Emma Donahue, right? Um, so I'm showing you here the comp is not just the similarity score, which is based on a score of 0 to 100, but we can also sort by categories like characters, tone and style, setting, themes. And so we're talking about a lot of different things. This is a lot of information for marketers. Um, and as you can recall, probably, if you've read these books and I try to pick something popular, is that they all do have that similar female kind of uh, character who is unfortunately sexually abused. Her main goal in life is having children, right? And so, as you can see, this really makes sense of comping. So if, for example, you're trying to look for a book and you are the publisher of the room, you could say, for, for people that love The Handmaid's Tale, right? So this isn't a solution for that. I think there's another solution for this. Anybody who's done advertising, um, Amazon ads, right? You can pick the books that you want to be placed next to, and so there's another application there. I think there's a lot of applications for comps when you start adding in performance data, which we do for the movie studio side. So for example, if we were to put in all the Amazon sales rank, and you could literally look and see who's above you, uh, actually below you because the rank goes down, and you could figure out, okay, what are they doing on their Amazon product page that's making their books sell more? Um, is it their pictures? Is it their dialogue? So, so what are they doing? So I think there's a lot of really interesting applications for comps. And the biggest trend right now in entertainment, the biggest trend is direct-to-consumer. And you're seeing the world's largest entertainment companies like Disney and Warner Media going after this space hard because they know they have got to get better audience information. And I feel like it's the same thing for publishers, right? But how do you do that in a way that is compelling and engaging and sticky and fun? Well, you do what Netflix is doing. You find fun marketing collections from all of the books that you have available, right? And so an example for this is that using machine learning, you can come up with um, categories for all of your titles. So for example, over Halloween, any book that has a creature mentioned in it, you can have a creature feature. Now again, you're gonna have to write that email or that social media post, but this is this kind of content that is engaging consumers. Again, you know, it's Valentine's Day, maybe you want romance with a plot twist, right? And obviously using AI and the stuff that Monica showcased, we can do that. So I think there's a lot of really fun applications when it comes to going direct to consumers. Um, and I was part of that panel where they're talking about um, Anansi using Shopify to have their own. And so this is a way to drive right, leads to convert on your own book selling sites. And, and having this large amount of data set in a data set, mm -hmm. is it do you have to pu pull the data and then scrap it once your AI has built the list of data points it needs? Uh, is it contracts with publishers? What's the, what are the legal mm -hmm. issues you have? And, and there are different, um, it, certain con, and we do this with studios too, all have different things that they're interested. So some studios are like, please take all these scripts because because you know it's great if we have them and we don't have to purchase them and we can use them. And others, we keep carefully siloed. So what happens a lot with the, the publishers too is that we're, we are purchasing the best sellers, the current ones, to make sure that we're testing and modeling and including those. Um, we also get a lot of um, books from publishers. They send it directly because they want the information. And so we're really careful. So um, depending on what the publisher wants, that's how we handle it. So we're built up to silo that. We also, most of the books that we deliver information back on, we're not keeping and we're not using in our models. Um, and so, so those, I mean, that's sort of the short answer for how we, care, we, we handle that. But it's obviously super important, right? Because this is the IP that, that matters. One of the other nice things, just security-wise, is that we're not sending books around through the system, and not, nor movie scripts. I mean, because we're getting movie scripts before the movies come out, too, which is a really big deal, right? And so, um, because once we measure them, we don't need to move the, that actual script around. And, you know, in like the whole worst case, we're hacked. And the, you remember the spreadsheet I showed you, or some of that data, you can't recreate a script from it. Which I think also points to this area of like, you know, you shouldn't be fearful of, of, of the AI um, 
taking jobs. I mean, to, to the AI, that's what a script looks like. Like, that's not what this, what a story is supposed to feel like. So you can't take that and then put back together a book. Um, so have you guys ever used your uh, models to create content as opposed to just assessing it? No. No, I don't, I don't think AI is there yet. And oh. certainly not for the level of fiction. Like, what we're trying to work with is real stories, right? And AI is great at, at taking um, you know, a spreadsheet and then turning it into, like, if it's financial information or weather, like saying, if this is the temperature, you know to say, the temperature today is, and insert it. That's, you know, AI can do something pretty close, but it's not creating stories, and we're not, we're not trying to do that. Let's see. So, um, so one of the things, and I'm, I guess I want to just like, so our email is up there, but we're happy to be like resources and have conversations later, because I always feel like sometimes these conversations are like a, a big data dump, and then you walk away try, trying to put it together. And also, a lot of what we're talking about um, really is still evolving. Like, there's a lot that's still in its infancy. And so um, I always encourage people to find a way, um, anyway, not, you know, not with us, but find a way somewhere to, to test and start playing around with this. Because I think there's real value in understanding what's new and trying to find ways to get comfortable. Um, all the, you know, the tech companies that are competing with all the entertainment publishing companies are for sure working on this. So this is something that's going to be happening that your competitors are going to be doing. And so finding a way, even if it's not a good fit now, to understand it and to just see how it might slot into processes when you do need to suddenly, you know, ramp up or speed up, I, you know, think is a good idea. Um, because they show a lot of trends. And, and the trick is you want to be comfortable enough so when the technology is fully, fully fleshed and operational that you're ready to jump on it. And the only way you do that is by playing around a little bit with it now. Because um, I think, and I, I don't know the right number of years, but you're just going to see a big explosion in this as it gets, um, as, as it gets you know, easier and easier to do. Um, have you tried working with non-English titles? And is that because I'm going to talk about similar topics afterwards, but oh, good. from the French uh, book publishing industry point yeah. of view. So my my when we did the project, our concern was that we did not find a lot of natural language processing tools that would support French or Spanish, Italian, and so on. So do, do you have any experience with that and things to share? Yeah, we we have looked so a lot of so. So one thing that we do use some of the off-the-shelf, and there's a lot of off-the-shelf models that have been translated. And so what we do, and because we have the, the system already built, then is we can do it, and we can then apply it to the narrative type of text. And so um, we're not doing it yet, mainly because as a company, we don't have the, like the support or the, 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 you know, the sales structure for it. Um, but we've talked about it a lot. Um, and I, I think it's doable. I think you have to have a reason, and that's part of why there's not a lot of companies doing this, is you've got to find the value in it. So there's got to be the market to do it. But, but I, I mean, French would be my first choice to start on. <laughs> but the French and Spanish, we did have uh, an investor that's approached us about doing it in Chinese, which is really different because, of, right? So that's a further step. So the romance languages are easier. So yeah, yes, I think it's possible. I think it's equally hard to, to start from zero. And I'm happy to talk to you later if there's a way that we can then, you know, you can be the French side of it and use what we've already done. I think that's a great idea. So, hi. Uh, in terms of trends that you've discovered, what was a trend that was surfaced that was like most unexpected or most surprising to you? Um, I'll throw it to you next. I, I really was surprised that guns as a theme was level. And so, and I mentioned that, but like you have all this stuff, you know, everything that's going on. So the trends that I was surprised is that guns, and this is across movies and books, was, was, was level. And then the other thing is that with all the Me Too mo movement, everything, all the talk that's happening on the film side, that there's no increase in female dialogue, there's no increase in feminism as a theme, but yet you see that in books. And so, I, I mean, so, you know, like, you know, you know, diversity. I mean, some of the diversity numbers in film is actually, it, 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 it's not a steady this, it's not even steady level, it's kind of doing this. So um, that, those to me were the, I mean, I hate that it was all negative, but that, those were the ones that surprised me. Did you have? A standout surprise? Um, just the differences between books and movies was really fascinating and also funny going down. I mean, I guess it's part of the climate that we're in. 
but that's kind of surprising, I thought, mm -hmm. because I feel like people want to read to, you know, lighten their day, right? So. I was at a, another conference that talked about AI and ethics, and um, I'm, I'm wondering whether in that you're dealing with information that exists, if you feel that there's any possibility that by constantly dwelling on that which is working in the environment now that there it could lead to a sameness in storytelling. Yes, so this is a big part of AI, right? This is the risk of AI, is that you just create more of the same. And um, I say this more to the movie people than you guys, but that's already happening, right, without, without AI. And so one of the ways that we use the AI then to break the cycle is to recognize that there are elements that appeal to mass audiences. There is a comfort zone that means that an audience will read the book, right? You don't suddenly write it upside down generally or reverse the words. You know, I'm not really gonna sing up here right because you would be uncomfortable. Like we all know, <laughs> and I would be too, but we all know the, so there's a certain structure to what we're all doing and that happens in books too. But if you, if you create the same thing over and over again, it's not gonna work. So part of what we encourage and the way we display um, the data is to say, hey, here's some standout, this is what's different in this book from other books and my recommendation is always embrace it okay Wonder Woman read the character um, as a strong male lead right now once you say that she's a female she stood out as an anomaly but obviously that's what they want to do and I think that's the way you do it is find what's different and then embrace it now there are probably some things that are different that you that you are fearful about but um uh, and I think, of course, this information could be misused, but if you create the same thing over and over again, that's not, that's not going to work or it's going to have a breaking point. So we're trying to use this to call out, hey, what's different? 90%, see, I'm going to get this slightly off, 85 to 90% of the female characters in movies read the same, right? So let's flag the ones that are unique and pull that out. We can do that somewhat, but as I mentioned, we're really on the protagonist in books, but there's a lot of things you can pull out that are unique, and I would say, hey, celebrate it and publish it. Don't say, well, we're, we're breaking 3% of the rules for this audience, let's not do it. No, I'd say, hey, we're only breaking 3% of the rules, where else can we push it? And now we've got something. So again, that's Sheldon sitting here, and are you gonna do exactly what Sheldon says? I hope not, <laughs> but, it should help you, you know, ask questions that maybe you wouldn't think of because you're not making a comparison to tens of thousands of books, you know.